Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmelzley. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. This is the second episode in our series about modern data science and analytics. Now, let me first remind you as a PSA that Google Analytics is switching in June 2023. You need to set aside time to migrate to GA4. Now, we're going to talk about GA4 a little bit in this episode. So, now it's time to get into the episode. One that looks at the world of digital marketing through the eyes of an analyst. Now, some of us may be lucky enough to have analysts at our workplace. Some of us became self-taught analysts on our own. But one thing that can help all of us is a book that maps out what it's like to analyze marketing data. And the one we discuss today may just be that book. As Google's chief analytics evangelist, our guest is responsible for leading the design, implementation, and evolution of programs that help businesses around the world realize what they can do with data. He has a proven track record of building large, high-functioning analytics organizations and leading large profit and loss centers identifying business opportunities, and creating effective marketing programs. What we're going to talk about today is his book, Digital Marketing Analytics, in Theory and in Practice, now out in its second edition. He has a unique blend of working both at major advertising agencies and at Google. And he taught that whole time analytics courses for universities near to his home, such as the University of Chicago, the University of Notre Dame, and the University of Illinois. So I'm really excited to bring you to this interview with Kevin Hartman. Welcome to the show, Kevin Hartman. Thank you. Very, very happy to be here. It's wonderful to have you. We are here to talk about your book. Would you kindly tell me what the name of it is? Yeah, uh, the book is called um, Digital Marketing Analytics in Theory and in Practice. Um, it is a book that I've, I've written in an attempt to make analytics really very accessible because it, it has become such a critical part of every aspect of business. And so in that book, I've tried to balance the theoretical with the practical to build skill as well as understanding for why that skill is important. Yeah, and uh, I've noticed that it's quite current. So I was reading the second edition, uh, and I can imagine that there was a lot of updates to it. Uh, when ha- when did that one come out? The second edition came out in, I believe, it was September of 2020. So I am on the I am on the cusp of a third edition, which is one of the wonderful things about presenting, uh, building a book right in this time and age is that it's a very easy process of updating and yeah. in an analytics field like we are in today that moves so quickly it's it's really important to to your point to stay up and stay current on for on- sure and the the marketing part of the book i mean there are many books written for mm-hmm. analysts yeah. um but it would be would be fair if i boiled it down to saying that the marketing nature of the book is to try and point analytics towards communication and to see if information that is going from, let's say, the seller of a book to, or sorry, a seller of a product to buyers, if that is all working. Is, is that a fair assessment? That is very fair. I mean, marketing for me is such a practical application of the skill of analytics as well as the theory. And it's where I come from. It's, it's, I've always been a marketer, so it's, I can speak from practical experience. But truthfully, I think the, the ideas, the frameworks, the things that we are presenting in that book uh, really do pull through to any application of analytics, whether that is marketing or finance or even in the nonprofit segments. Uh, I've had uh, students of the book really come to me and tell me that it, how relevant it is to, to their varied industries. Mm-hmm. And I would hope that if someone lands a job and they're, you know, the only analyst in their organization, uh, that they could think of your book as something of a, a, a guide for how to get started um, and then to deepen their craft. 
what I think they uh, would be wise to start at with your book is the understanding. You say that analytics uh, isn't necessarily about turning everything upside down, you know, pointing out to people that uh, they, they have everything wrong in the as is state and that there's some kind of amazing promise land that, you know, the analysts can take them to all of a sudden. Um, you say that's just not how analytics works. Um, even if you want to think about that long term, in the near term, you point out some really basic steps you're going to take, planning, collecting, analyzing reporting. And you can use that cycle to eventually end up at some vastly different place, but it's a very functional iterative model that you're just going to use time and time again, right? Absolutely. And it is very process uh, heavy, right? Because there, there is an approach to bringing data into a set of decisions. And, and what those data can do, to your point, is certainly point us to a different direction. But, but more often than not, it sort of substantiates some of those things that we already intuitively felt or find some of those things that, you know, even incrementally improve our business, improve our, uh, our, our functioning, um, things that we just wouldn't have seen before because we are now in the data and discovering new stories, new insights, new patterns. Uh, using those that approach to analysis. Yeah, and I guess the other thing that it's always good for an analyst to do is to look within. Um, you point out that just like the people that are uh, perhaps buying a product and have a preconceived notion about brand A versus brand B, analysts have biases too. Mm. And so, you know, you point out that that good old scientific method is something that we should push ourselves towards, that we should form a hypothesis and then get the what, why, and how of it so that we don't fall prey to, you know, the, the mistakes of, you know, finding a whole lot of data and then railroading it into some kind of conclusion that's wrong. Absolutely. I mean, look, we are, we are awash with data, right? And, and with great data, comes great responsibility, <laughs> all right? right? Because we can we can tell so many stories. We can find such insight, um, these patterns that I talk about in 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 data. And to your point, right, if we approach that with some preconceived notion, um, we can very easily fall victim to uh, to to all sorts of biases, from confirmation bias to anchoring bias. Uh, you know, and everything in between. And so I, I do make a point in the book to kind of call those things out and how they really infect each of those steps in the process. Because, frankly, the only way for us to avoid them is to understand them and to know them and be able to spot them and, and work in our process to counter the effects of those biases. Uh, very well put. So you mentioned quite a few other people in the field who have laid groundwork. Um, you mentioned that we should be thinking like, I believe it was Eric Peterson who said, you know, there's a pyramid of knowledge. And, yes. you know, while we maybe in our early days are just happy to have that data yeah. that, you know, we have to think about getting higher up the pyramid. Can you tell us what's at the top of the pyramid? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Eric Peterson had this wonderful concept in the very early days of analytics before there was really much digital to it, yeah. And his idea of the 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 pyramid was was that uh, you know the 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 data uh, data value and data availability was sort of inversely related. And at the top of that pyramid that that Eric described was uh, the this this tremendously valuable uh, personal level data. And so. What has happened is that those data are still available and still tremendously valuable when we can tie data back to a specific customer, or sp specific person, and understand what they like and what they don't like, what they'll do and what they won't do, how they react to certain influences. That is tremendously insightful for a marketer, for anyone in any industry, right? What has changed in the days since this pyramid principle was sort of promoted is that that top of the pyramid has really been blown off. 
Um, we have so much data now that can be tied back to an individual consumer to the point that finally regulation is starting to catch up with some of the practices that have been allowed to sort of spawn because of this great opportunity. Um, and now we're facing cookie deprecation and we're facing, uh, you know, reactions in the market from Apple and others that are starting to, to, to tighten some of those data or at least force uh, marketers and advertisers who are using those data to use them in a much more responsible, transparent way. And so it's, uh, it's been a very interesting ride to witness from the days of those early, you know, the early postulation of what digital uh, data could mean to analytics to where we are today. And it, it's really a fascinating thing that I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing where we go, where we wind up. Yeah. And, and the, uh, what I love about you, including these approaches is that um, some of us might be down in our cups about the loss of the data that, you know, the good old 20 teens yeah. uh, had. Um, but you, you say that, you know, if we really have our fundamentals correct, then we we'll still be able to do our jobs. Yeah. Uh, there, there may be, you know, this, this is what, you know, sampling uh, helps us do. This is, you know, these are good old statistical measures. Uh, and then you layer on top things like the Bain uh, model of where they say you need to focus yeah. not only on, you know, the measurement and, you know, we, we always talk about just having all that data in the first place, but they say, don't forget activation and don't forget the ways of working Yes. with that data, because those will, uh, you know, if you pay attention to those tried and true ways, you will still get what you have, even if, let's say, your measurement component isn't as strong. Yeah, you know, because what we what what Bain is describing, and there are other models from BCG and others that are, are really describing this, uh, this evolution of maturity, of digital maturity, right? And, and that has has naturally happened. Uh, as a result of us having more data, having more technology, having these opportunities. And, and what Bain and BCG and others have done such a wonderful job of is kind of stepping in and really demonstrating what that path to maturity looks like, right? Now that you have these opportunities, how do you take advantage of them? What is required of you? And so those frameworks are, are a, a really wonderful way for advertisers and others who are using these data to, to really get their head around what they must do to indeed get the fullest, uh, realize the, the, the most from those data. And it, another interesting thing about that whole dynamic that you bring up is, um, you know, we largely have become somewhat lazy in our use of data because we've had so much of it, because it has been so valuable, because there are so many companies now working in this space that have been guiding and helping uh, advertisers and others with their technology, with, with their data. Uh, what I've seen is that some companies have become so reliant on that help, on that, that stream of contribution from others that they've really lost the the reason that they were using the data in the first place which which was really there to just support and guide their own intuition their own marketing ideas that answer the questions that they have right I, I, I've seen it time and time again that these advertisers sort of forget that they were asking questions of the data and have become just reliant on the processes uh, the automation that has been built what this reckoning has done with cookie deprecation and others that are sort of removing or limiting much of the data that had been driving us to that place of somewhat lazy marketing, lazy use of data, is reminding us that, oh yeah, this was all about our intuition and, and really answering the questions that we had. And, and frankly, we can still do that with much of the data that we're collecting. We, we might have to be a little more innovative in the way that we do it. We might have to rely on more modeling. But at its heart, what analytics promised has never gone away. Uh, I, I think we're just seeing a shedding of some of the bad habits, perhaps, that, that many companies had come to, come to just take for granted. Um, 
I'll underline, you know, your criticism and I think it it's well placed. We're recording this here in 2022. We have an old version, a 15 year old version of Google Analytics, which is going away. And uh, whether it is analysts or the management that the analysts answer to, there's people, you know, running around calling the sky, uh, the, the fall of the sky, um, where, you know, you're saying, well, wait a minute, step back and think about it. You always wanted to have your questions answered. Um, you know, would you say that this is just another proof point that we need to put our thinking caps on and not just be report generators? It is. It, it, it underlines again for, it underlines several things. For the advertiser, it underlines that responsibility of approaching analytics with a hypothesis, with a question, with some clear objective from the collection of and analysis of data, right? For the analyst, it just underscores this responsibility to the process, to the, the idea that w w data is not some magical unlock. It, it is something that is there for us to use skill to pull insight from. And we need to take a very measured and structured approach to doing that. Um, it, it, it has, you know, undeniably, it's become a little more difficult because of the things that we are facing in the industry. But, uh, but again, in my experience, much of that difficulty is, is, is just chipping away at some of the laziness and some of the bad habits maybe that we had, we had developed anyways. We're, we're really kind of getting a return to uh, where analytics uh, really should have been all along. Right. I do have one other um, Google, question about Google Analytics, and then we'll get into some other tools, but we're going to take a really quick break, and then we'll be right back. We'll get right back to the conversation, but I'll first take a moment to talk about the switch Google's making to their whole analytics platform. There are many ways to move to Google Analytics 4 out there, and one of them that's included for free with GA4 is the web analytics data that you see in the interface, but in database form. You can seize this chance to consolidate raw Google Analytics data with your other systems. And since you're going on a full-blown migration to a new product anyway, you should consider pulling in data from your other systems so that you can analyze and visualize them for your entire funnel. Now, you're going to have to learn some new things here, but you don't have to be overwhelmed by it when you have an expert personally guiding you. I'm going to be having these GA Fast Forward workshops as two-day sessions where attendees leave with actual dashboard reports that show stakeholders the data that's tied to their business performance. So whether you've had GA4 installed already or are still on Universal Analytics, you can take advantage of this. And the next workshops are in Ottawa and Montreal in December. You can find information on them by going to gafastforward.com. So GA as in Google Analytics, and then the words fast forward. You can either use the number four in forward, or you can spell it all out. Either way, I'll get you there. Either all right, we're back. And uh, Kevin, we were just talking about Google Analytics and uh, how we seem to be at a uh, junction of um, really refining uh, what it is that we need. Um, I'm going to start with just a, a beautiful little anecdote you had in the book about a conversation between an analyst and a VP of sales. Uh, I think in this one, the VP of sales was uh, being pretty prescriptive to the analyst. I've got this idea. I need you to go get this, this, and this, and I need you to, and, and you said that the analyst, and I can imagine there's a power dynamic here too. I don't know, but I was reading into it. You know, the analyst was like, you know, four levels of management down. And yet the analyst had a simple question that changed everything. What was that question? That question is is why. What is it you're trying to solve, right? And and this is this is such a, a cultural unlock for any any company that is using data uh, is is to allow that analyst to use their expertise uh, uh, in data to solve problems. And and the the anecdote basically just. Com uh, communicates one of the biggest challenges that any analytics team is going to face, and that is how do you work with non 
analysts, right? Those, right. those business leaders who don't have the same kind of expertise as you. If you allow those, if I should say the company allows the non-analyst to come to the analyst and say, I want a BDI, CDI, I want a segmentation study because I have a problem I'm solving and be, to your point, very prescriptive in what they're returning, that that analyst is not going to be happy. The results are going to be suboptimal. They, they might actually not provide the things that are really, truly needed to solve that problem. This is why, in in my experience, when analytics teams are functioning at the highest level possible, the non-analysts come to those analysts and say, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. How right. would data help me? And it's then the responsibility of that analyst to, to, to think on it, go back uh, and, and, uh, to, the, to the non-analyst at some point and say, Here are, here's my, my solution, here's my recommendation, and this is what we think would be the best way to solve that problem. In that way, the, the non-analyst is using their expertise in diagnosing a business challenge, and the analyst is using their expertise in, in using data to solve problems everybody's happy, everybody works in the most efficient way possible. For sure. That two-way dialogue is critical for another reason. Uh, I mean, yes, we want the non-analyst to end up getting the answer that is going to help them make decisions. But on the analyst side, if the analyst was just dropped into this industry, this business, they might not set up UTM parameters to track the right things. They may not, you talk about micro conversions, they may not look at the website and say, aha, these things are micro conversions. And I can even layer conversion values against each of them to give me a way to dollarize how important this person coming to our site is, right? So they've got to be in the dialogue. Yes, absolutely, they do. And you uncover another very important thing is that that analysts, when they are doing their job well, they have a great understanding of business strategy. Right. And so they are not just a technical wizard. They, they understand how to place the data, the technical, uh, the technology that they're using in the context of the business objectives, in the context of business goals. And they can do that translation between data and business results, um, which which makes them just so much more valuable for the organization. No doubt. For those that are using uh, paid media, which is, of course, a big part of this, and I guess I'll just try to narrow it to, uh, let's say, a company like a B2B company where uh, it, it there may be components that happen uh, later on. But what we really want to understand is when they're advertising digitally, uh, so not mass market TV, you know, radio, but if they're advertising digitally, they want to understand what their marketing spend um, is translating to. One thing that you caution people against doing is just to use the tool for that individual channel. So if it's a LinkedIn or a Facebook or a uh, even a Google Ads, uh, when you're using that single channel by itself, uh, you're not properly attributing, or let's put it this way, that tool is going to attribute everything to itself because that's the only sphere right. that it sees. You, I'm wondering if you believe it's possible for, let's say, Google Analytics 4 or another, you know, leading edge analytics tool to be able to bring all of those together in a multi-touch way to give a company an appreciation for what that paid ad spend is doing for them across channels. Well, yeah, yes. I mean, that's the intent of the tools that, that what we would call our, our cross-channel attribution tools. And this includes things like like GA. It includes um, other approaches. It includes multi-touch attribution models. And, and it's important here, I think, to draw a distinction between those tools, uh, cross-channel attribution tools, and then what we'd call single-channel attribution tools. You know, Google has our, we have ours. Um, um, Facebook has theirs, right? And, and what those tools are really good at, and frankly, because they are not cookie-reliant, they are not impacted by any of the deprecation challenges that we have. They are wonderful at saying, here's how you optimize spend on this channel, right? You effectively put the best foot forward in your Facebook spend and investment, in your, uh, your, your television spend and investment. Whatever that single channel is, you can use an optimization tool to improve your investment there. But what those tools don't do 
is tell you where should my next dollar go, right? Because sure. you, they are simply there to sort of optimize that single channel. The, the cross-channel tools are the ones that are tackling that larger question. Yes. And frankly, those are the ones that are a little more under strain because of cookie deprecation, because of the other challenges uh, in the industry today. Yeah. What tool you look at is premised upon what question you're asking. Um, like I think even within a single channel, like you say, um, I gather, you know, you go into detail about how the metrics that you would have for video campaigns are going to be different than the metrics that you've got to track for email or for search campaigns. So it's that single channel that is going to take you down into those rabbit holes and help you understand for this audience at this point in the funnel, this individual ad format probably could do better, but this other one here is just rocking it. Right. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, to what we're our conversation, the, the, there are tools that you can use to help point you in those directions, but also look, this gets back to the importance of the intuition of a marketer and just customer understanding and knowing how a customer is using a channel for what purpose to what end and how your advertising can impact them and their uh, their objective on that channel, right? And, and yep. so, uh, again, these are basic marketing concepts and ideas, right? That, that we've, unfortunately, we've allowed, I think, as I said, data to sort of obscure and, and move us from um, because of the, uh, because of that, that sort of, laziness that I've talked about, but, uh, it's all coming around again. I can see it, it, it seems to be, I think, I think we're lifting the blinders, uh, and you know, you go broader in another part of the book where you say there are other data sets that we can bring together with the part, the second party data, for example, that, uh, is gathered, uh, or even first party data that we have on our clients. Uh, you talk about facilitated download, mm-hmm. uh, data sets, Mm-hmm. And then you talk about some of the even uh, third party and, you know, how some people even take it upon themselves to scrape data. Um, these, are, these are important pieces to the puzzle, aren't they? They certainly are. And they're wonderful tools and um, opportunities for the analyst. Right. And, and it's uh, and, and frankly, that that is the sort of, in my opinion uh, and in my experience, those are the sorts of challenges that analysts want to take on. They, they want to grab onto those big, difficult to answer questions, and they want to use their skill in collecting data to help answer it, rather than just being someone who's monitoring an automated way to provide insight, right? So um, th- that idea of, of using open source data, the idea of when it's necessary and when there is consent, scraping data, to answer right. questions yeah. are, are, are wonderful tools in the analyst tool chest and things that, that we, we, sh- we should use. I, I think they just are also a mirror of what's great about doing this in an age where we've got the internet. I mean, this is, if I even think of things like Stack Overflow, this yeah. is a wonderful way for us to help each other. These data sets were uh, collected by people who were trying to solve a problem. And then when they share it with others, they're kind of doing it on the hope that others will share their data too. Absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. And I, I can, there, there is so much open source data. It, it's, it's mind boggling for me who's been doing this a long time. And, and re, you know, I, I vividly remember the days when data was difficult to come by. Uh, and, and there was a lot of proprietary data collected and used. And that was becoming this differentiator for organizations. We have this data. No one else has these data. Right. And uh, uh, it, 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 we're in a, a, a much better place now, in my opinion, where data is uh, more accessible. And now the real differentiator is the analyst or the organization's ability to drive impact from data broadly. Right? Yes. Rather than just provide unique and proprietary data. I think that right. everyone participating from yes. the analyst to the marketer, that is such a, a better, more effective uh, market, if you will. 
for them. Yeah. I mean, the, the picture that I have to myself is that each of our own data sets is like a little tidal pool, but now the tide has come in and now oh, all cool. of everybody's little, you oh, know, collection yeah. can be shared, right? And everything's yeah. moving between everything else. APIs are facilitating this. It's great. Absolutely. Yeah. And now to, to that, to that analogy right now is how well can you swim? <laughs> right? It's just not, it's just not how, 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 uh, what kind of pool you had now it's now it's what can you do with it? Yeah. So uh, we'll good. take a quick second to talk about the languages because, uh, I suppose if we keep going down these roads of, uh, bringing all this data together, um, we're clearly past spreadsheets and mm-hmm. even just a, a simple relational, uh, database, uh, you know, with an interface We're we're into maybe, uh, asking direct queries mm-hmm. and then, uh, doing some transformations of the data. So give us your take from, uh, how an analyst should look at things like Python and R yeah. and SQL and, you know, where those fit in the mix. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, like uh, the, the spreadsheet tools are still important and, and, and deserve their place in the analyst world. Right. But uh, a tool like SQL is, is sort of table stakes to be able to understand how to use that to, or, or no SQL, if that's um, the, the database you're using some way, right. To, to access, and query large data sets is just the way of the analyst today. But to your point, the idea of using more advanced tools like R and Python um, are, are just critically important for the analyst. I mean, look, like, like we've been saying, we're, we are working with so much data and to tackle the kind of questions we want to answer, you need a much more advanced tool. You need a more advanced language. And Python and R uh, for my money still are the best ways for analysts to effectively answer questions, work with large amounts of data and, uh, and, and really, um, uh, provide value from that, uh, from a, a technological standpoint. Right. I, I guess the way I'm looking at it, uh, yes, it, the, the data has grown so large and that even if someone, and, and you, describe yourself as a non-programmer. So do I. Uh, so, you know, we might at first buck the, buck the uh, possibility of learning those languages, but instead when we think, okay, our data is now like industrial size, so we need industrial strength tools to understand this industrial size data. Um, there's just no uh, other way around it. And then another thing that I really like you said was if we liken the way that we're sourcing the true insights out of this information, we should imagine that we're diving into this data, uh, not like someone who is maybe panning for gold or, you know, we should instead think about diamonds and the way that, you know, they are formed. They're simply formed through condensing something we have a lot of down to a very small thing. Yes, it's essence, right? And and that's we. I, I talk about the that that difference, and and you know you you capture it perfectly. That, that, that sometimes there is this idea that the analyst is just sifting through tons and tons of data until they find that golden insight, and that that is not really, nor it's not an efficient way to approach it for sure. Nor is it the way it really works in practical application. We we are we are dealing with tons and tons of data, and we are trying to compress those data down into these patterns, these insights, these learnings. And that is, I think I reference it as a diamond insight, this idea of taking all this matter and material and compressing it down to its essence. Um, and sometimes you come out with something very beautiful, right? And, and so yeah. that's, the, that's the idea there. Yeah, it, it, we just need to make sure that we keep in mind what the role of the tools are and that uh, we ourselves need to have a an approach to the data where we get to choose what's in our toolbox. Uh, we don't let the tools themselves, you know, dictate and, you know, let the hammer say, okay, everything's a nail. Precisely. We, right. You know, and I'll say like, I, there, there's a raging debate um, uh, between Python and R and I totally yes. understand it. Right. And I've been very clear and I'm clear in the book that I, I uh, years ago chose R as my path. I still, I know Python well enough, but yep. not nearly to the extent that I know R uh, and and I, I recently heard a wonderful sort of analogy, a way to think about this. And okay. it, just, it returns us to this idea that, look, Python and R are languages, right? And so which language are you going to choose? Well, 
think about it this way. If you are moving from where you are today, yeah. uh, I'm here in Chicago, to a new city, say I'm going to Hamburg, Germany, I'm going to learn German, right? If I was going to, to Madrid, Spain, I'm going to learn Spanish. And, and so the idea of which one do you choose should be dictated by the team that you're joining, yeah. which language do they speak, right? Which one do they use? And, and, and that, I think, is such a wonderful, clear way to think about how you make the decision. It's whatever decision is most practical to you. And it, that, you that's right. At, at Google, we use a lot of R. There are, there are some other teams that use Python, but um, uh, learning that the, the, the R language is, is required here. And so, because everyone else speaks it. And so that's, sure. that's, that's the, that's the best I, uh, kind of, uh, approach that I've heard, uh, and on which one should you choose? I love it. Uh, we're going to now then go to what you devote a significant part near the end of the book on, which is, let's say we have these insights. Now, how do we get them across to people? Uh, so I guess the easiest way to say that we should not do it is to just dump all the data on them, right? To take our raw data sets and uh, push them up on slides and 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 just let those people sit in a room uh, like that character in A Clockwork Orange, right? With the eyelids held open. No, no, don't do it that way. Um, it, you point out that, well, actually the way that you describe that is to tell us a bit about how our brains work. Yeah. So can you maybe just help remind us kind of neurology 101 and why that's bad? Yes, no, and, and that's so important for us, any storyteller, right, to, to have an appreciation for, particularly a data storyteller. But, the you know, our brains are these wonderfully complicated things. Um, and when we are interpreting images, it's our brain that is doing the work there. And, and I, I try to make it just as simple as I can by saying there's a frontal lobe that we have as humans called the prefrontal cortex, which is where we do all of our higher level thinking, right? And there are, there's countless experiments that demonstrate what happens when someone's prefrontal cortex is engaged. And frankly, basically, they just miss the obvious because they are thinking so hard, um, because they are using their brain, that part of their brain, to, to process and generate thought. The implication for us as what I would call data designers, people who are trying to communicate to other humans using imagery, is that if that prefrontal cortex is working so hard because you have put up a very confusing, messy chart, then they are going to miss the obvious. For one thing, they're not going to hear a word you're saying because they are so laser focused on trying to figure out your chart. Um, they're going to miss that story. They're going to miss some of the things that we believe are so straightforward as well. So the, the antidote is to design charts in ways that, that keep that prefrontal cortex very quiet and still. Uh, and you do that through some very practical approaches that I describe in the, in the book uh, and just making charts that, that more quickly, efficiently and effectively connect with, with our audiences. You not only say there's charts and you have an amazing uh, breakdown of which charts are good for showing relevance versus ranking versus clustering, et cetera. But you point out that we should be using some of those tools that, the guys over down the hall uh, doing UX on the website are using. You're using color. You're using intensity, saturation. You're using uh, distance, white space. These are all like, this isn't new, but we, we sometimes don't spend the time before the presentation getting that part right, getting, getting the basically the amount of human um, intuition thought into the chart. Correct. And this gets back to, you know, we talked, we, we talked a little bit about some of the elements uh, or functional roles that the analyst plays. And we talked about, you have to have some technical skill, right? Because you have to be able to deal with data. You have to have that business strategy skill so that you can put that data in the context of the business. Yep. Just as important, maybe even more important is that third skill. And again, it's what I call the data designer, which is understanding how to communicate then those stories that you want to tell through data 
to your audience, to people who have not invested time in conducting the research that you did, who didn't have any of the context that you've earned over the project, right? And, and so doing that requires you to very much, to your point, think like a UX designer. Think, think of how a human is going to experience the chart that you're presenting. And there is a right way to do it and many, many wrong ways to do it. And, and, and I devote so much time to it in the book because in my experience, I just haven't seen it taught well enough. Uh, and, and I wanted to make sure that I provided something to the analysts to help them be better in that phase. Yeah. And you generously point out that there are other others like you that people can uh, get this learning from. Uh, you point out uh, people that describe it in a different way, like David McCandless. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you're just like, I don't care, you know, who you subscribe to, but this is really important in whichever way you can assimilate this information. Yeah. I want you to do it. Yeah. Yeah, there and, and there are wonderful thinkers that can really help in this space, right? And, um, and and I've mentioned a couple of them to you before, right? Donna Wong is one. Um, Scott Bernato is another. There, there are just there are people who have done some wonderful work in the space of communicating with data, uh, and and what I try to do is, is sort of provide my own perspective for sure, but but you know provide a, t a hat tip to many of those others who have have also wonderful thought uh, about that space and the importance of communicating with data. And in a book that covers so many other bases, I'm just glad that you devote the time that you did uh, to that part, because I do think that someone, if we liken this to a race, that they can get all the way to a couple of yards from the finish line and miss it. They can still fail if they don't get that piece of storytelling right. And it's heartbreaking <laughs> for everyone, right? Because I know, you know, particularly for, for, for me, I, I recognize how much time has gone into the, the, the planning for analysis, the collection of data, the, the analysis of those data. And then you get to the end, and I, I've been in rooms before where analysts have sort of trotted out their charts, and I, I recognize that they know the story. They understand what is there, but it takes us, you know, several minutes uh, to, to just uh, of the analyst kind of sweating through the description to explain what that insight is, what that chart does indeed say. Once they get there, right, I've been there where there's a collective aha and everyone says, oh, I get it. But the problem with that is, depending on how this is being presented, if you then... Uh, if, if the executive in the room gets your deck and takes it home that night and flips back through it, they're not going to remember that story. They're going to yeah. look at this chart and just be like, what did that person tell me? And more damagingly, they're going to make their own story up, right? Which, which just effectively just eradicates all of that important work that the analyst has done to get to that point. Uh, to to have that story to tell, and so it's it really is heartbreaking. And that the analyst, and you know, maybe I'm generalizing with personality types, but they may not be the most extroverted person. Um, when they are presenting that information, they have to remember. Uh, you know, I guess it was Howard Gossage. You know, you have to remember the person on the other side. They already have a conversation going on in their minds. Right. So you spoke of a specific instance where you were speaking with a C level person and uh, they were already convinced mm -hmm. of the kind of media they were buying and why it worked. And they were looking at, you know, two numbers and, and they just satisfied themselves that they understood it. And you had to have a fierce conversation with them where your your charts were maybe ready, but you had to first disavow them of. Yes. the ideas that they had so that they could even be receptive to your ideas. Yes. And this is why to our, to our earlier conversation, why a recognition of bias and understanding of bias is so important, right? A, so that you don't fall victim to them, but B, so that when you recognize someone else is, you can challenge them. Right. And that's exactly what we were, what, what I was. Uh, right. You call, you call the game and you say, aha, all right. 
Uh, I almost fell into that trap too. Now let me tell you how we avoid it and let me show you what is really going on. Correct. Yeah. Uh, just one other thing on the kind of recognition of biology. I love the fact that you said that sketching is okay to do yeah. uh, because I, you know, for me, that is a kinesthetic thing. We're moving out through our hands, but again, just like our brain sees, I guess our brain draws a, a lost art, you know, and, and this is, I, I can't say that I came up with this, right? This, this is particularly borrowed from some ideas from Scott Bernato that says, look, when you are sketching, you are free to unleash all of your creativity. Um, you know, the, the, uh, if you, if you have an idea for a chart and you sit down at your computer and fire up Tableau, for instance, you are going to be shackled by your use of Tableau, how well you know that tool, your proficiency there. When you sit down at a blank sheet of paper, there's nothing but you in that blank sheet of paper. And what the only thing that is going to come out on that page is, is, is born from your creativity. And then it's much easier to say, okay, if this is the chart that I think best expresses this data, how do I build it, right? And, and also for the analyst, it can lead to a very uh, important period of growth and learning where now you go and find a tool that, that is going to create the-, the Right, not the other way around, yeah. Precisely. Yeah, precisely. And, and I should also notice and mention that, you know, the great data visualization artists do this. David McCandless does this, right? I, I can guarantee you sketching is very important to, to those who, who really know what they're doing. And it's something that we all should adopt and embrace. I think what people should be embracing is uh, the interest in this field, which, you know, many people have, get a satisfying and full career out of. Um, and Kevin, I think that your book does an excellent job of making the case why that is so. Uh, if people want to find out about the book, where can they go to get it? You, you can simply find it on Amazon. It's, it's there. there. There are three versions. There's an E version of the book. There's also a black and white version of the print book, as well as a color version. Uh, and there's some price differential there. And we just tried to make it very accessible to everyone on any kind of budget. Uh, because I do, to your point, I feel like this is such an important idea set of ideas uh, for everyone to grasp whether you are that analyst with your hands on the keyboard or you are that person who is managing an analytics team or if you are just a business leader who is using data to make decisions having an appreciation and understanding of what is going on in the analytics field is critically important for all of us to be successful yeah and if people want to follow what you're doing or reach out where would the best way to be to do I'm that be I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me there very easily. Uh, I, I also, there, there's a course. I teach a number of courses at a, at a, a number of universities, which I'm proud to be a part of. Uh, but I also, there for, for those who are not in degree uh, pursuing mode, uh, there is a platform called Elevator, E-L-V-T-R, uh, that I teach at and, and have classes going on throughout the year on di digital marketing analytics, as well as data visualization and something that I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of as well. Perfect. So yeah, people can, uh, depending on their learning style, uh, get Kevin in whichever form works for them. Yeah, precisely. I'm so glad you came on the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. This has really been a great conversation. It has been, and I'm sure that it's left people with a sense of how they can get better insights into their data. And my hope is that it is used to help them make their funnels even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.